Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Stuart Burley, who's um, uh, a little bit of a, about his background, I, I asked him. Uh, he did his uh, PhD at Hull. Uh, long a long time ago. It seems a long time yeah. ago. A long time ago. Uh, and followed that up with postdoctoral work uh, at uh, uh, Bern in Switzerland, um, and then uh, worked in uh, uh, academia uh, at Manchester, uh, among other places, uh, before moving on to into the uh, uh, oil and gas industry uh, with uh, uh, what might be called PG or British Gas, uh, and a variety of other companies, uh, and uh, as retired in. Twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. It was just as COVID was outbreaking. I came back from Pakistan in March on a, a last flight into the UK. It was um, it was scary stuff. Uh, and uh, since retirement, he, he's, uh, uh, Stuart has been uh, involved with Keel, Keel University, a basin dynamics research group, and he's also the chair of the uh, Warwickshire uh, Geological Conservation Group. It's a very varied career. Um, uh, so the talk tonight is a very British summer in the late Triassic. Uh, torrential rain, the Arden sandstone, and the dawn, the dinosaurs. So I gave it to you. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. The title kind of says it all. It's got a bit of everything. It's got a bit of Arden sandstone sedimentology. It's got dinosaurs, it's got volcanoes, um, and we're going to learn about one of my heroes, Leonard Wills. I'm sure you're familiar with Leonard Wills. He was a local geologist at Birmingham. Um, and Lake Arden, which was this huge lake in the late Triassic um, that had dinosaurs, shark, clam shrimps, a whole fauna and flora, and we're going to learn about that. In fact, if you stood on the hills in Dudley in the late Triassic and looked out to the east, you'd have a panorama over Lake Arden. So we're going to take you back. In fact, one of my diagrams has Dudley in it. We're going to take you back through time and we're going to try and recreate Lake Arden. So yeah, I'm basically just um, an old man that knows a bit about geology uh, and I'm going to try and entertain you with some of that knowledge tonight. So the talk's got some gratuitous slides and, and, and some vaguely technical slides. This is one of the gratuitous ones. If you're in Utah or other nice desert locations, geology is easy. The rocks are there before you. You just walk over them and log them. If you're in Warwickshire, it's not quite the same. That's the Arden Sandstone Scarp. And that's what it's like most of the time. It's a bugger to find it. So since I retired, came back in you know, just as COVID was starting, I've sort of potted around Warwickshire and more or less the West Midlands, trying to find bits of the Arden Sandstone and recreate this story. And yet, yeah, um, it's very, very poorly exposed. Um, I've managed to get access to various boreholes, including some drilled by HS2, some drilled by um, the highways authority when they're making motorway service stations so you cobble together a story um, from very poor outcrops so just to set the scene what we're going to walk through I'm going to give you a bit of a context about the trias in the UK I'm sure you already know most of that but we'll just refresh it I'll talk about the Mercia Mudstone group which I've got quite interested in for all sorts of reasons um, as has Jonathan Turner. Um, maybe we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of the Arden Sandstone, which in all the memoirs is described as a rather um, dull, it's a maximum of seven or eight meters thickness, um, pale green colored fine grain silty sandstone. Actually, it's not. It's incredibly variable, both in thickness and lithology and, and its um, faunal and floral content. We're going to try and put together a story about the depositional system of the Arden Sandstone, so you'll understand how it was deposited. We'll then do a little side excursion 
to learn about the Reverend Peter Bollinger Brodie, who lived in the next village to me. He lived in Rowington, I live in Lapworth in Warwickshire. Brodie was the Reverend in the 1850s to 1897. Um, and he collected 25,000 fossils. He probably ignored most of his um, parishioners. 25,000 fossils, extraordinary. Um, he, was, he actually won the, um, um, one, of the, one of the Geological Society medals for his services, a, a vicar that did a fantastic amount of trisic geology. Then I'm going to sort of arm wave a bit and tell you what I think it all means. We'll talk about what um, these models of deposition in the Mercia Mudstone group really mean for uh, what processes were taking place, why these rocks are green, and then we'll talk about climate change and what it means for dinosaurs. There we go. So that's, that's the talk. It's quite a lot. Cram it all in. And on the right, um, thanks to the Canal and Rivers Trust and the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group, we've restored the type section, the triple SI of the Arden Sandstone, to its glory. You can now see the whole section that Brodie first described in about 1878 or thereabouts. Yeah, so it's now restored to... In fact, you can see the base of the Arden Sandstone. Here it is, look. Red Mercy Mudstone Group, Arden Sandstone starts and goes right to the top. So there's a full section of the Arden Sandstone visible for the first time in I don't know how many years. Great stuff. Thank you, Canal and Rivers Trust. Thank you, Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group. So let's try and set the scene. This is a map taken from a paper by um, Andy Newell with the BGS. Um, it shows the UK from a, an angle perspective. So we're looking from the south northwards. Um, I've got a pointer here, haven't I? Yeah, I have, yeah. So where's Dudley? Dudley's about there, isn't it? There's Dudley, somewhere there. So if you, if you were in Dudley in the late Triassic and you looked out to the east, you'd be looking out across these basins, fault-bounded basins, and in the Carnian, they were filled with water. It was a huge lake. So let's just set the scene a little bit. If you look at the southern part of Britain in the Triassic, the structural plane is east-west. That's because it's the Variscan structures that define the basin structures in the Trias. When you go into the Worcester Graben and into the Cheshire Basin, the orientation is north-south. And there's a high here. This is across the Mendips, across the Pusey High. There's a big high here that separates these deep basins in the south from the Worcester Graben, the Cheshire Basin, into the Irish Sea. And the same for out into the uh, East Midland Shelf. So these are rift basins formed as uh, Pangaea, the supercontinent, began to break up. And this is a, a very generalized map of, oops, sorry, whoa, let's just go back one. This is a global map showing Pangaea, the supercontinent, where all the continents were fused together. And the Triassic, actually the late Permian, the Triassic, mark the breakup of this supercontinent. So Britain is located uh, in the middle of the supercontinent. It was very hot, it was very arid, it's very dry, which is why all the permatricic rocks are mostly red colored. It was a desert. And then this diagram down here is a bit more close up. So here's Britain, here's the Welch Highlands. This is the London Brabant, Brabant Massif. Here's the Worcester Graben. Again, Dudley somewhere there. So looking east across Dudley, you'd see this desert plain in the valleys. Um, and the Worcester Graben was very deep. So the blue color is the deepest part of the basin. It's very deep here in the Weald Basin in the south, in the Wessex Basin, deep in the Worcester Graben, and deep in the Cheshire Basin. These are fault-bounded basins that fill with sediments. So let's see what sediments fill those basins. So this is a stratigraphic column. And this is time on the left-hand side, going back into the Permian. This is different basins across that north-south transect from the Wessex Basin into the Worcester, Worcester Graben, across the West Midlands, Cheshire Basin, in, into the East Irish Sea Basin. So this is time plus the stratigraphy, how they varied across the basin. So the Triassic started some 250 million years ago um, with the deposition of this big fluvial system. You're probably familiar with that in Cannock Chase, Chester Pebbleveds, 
coarse conglomerate. Um, and it's overlain by mostly fluvial sediments with some aeolian bits, which in this area is known as the Bromsgrove sandstone. We now have to call it the Helsby sandstone. Thank you, BGS. It's then overlain by the Mercia mudstone group, the basal part of which is a thing called the Tarpoli siltstone. Very poorly exposed, not well understood. Um, I've just been looking at it in some HS2 cuttings around Birmingham where they're taking out the um, ground for the interchange beyond Coal Sill into Curzon Street. Um, and then you go into this thick sequence of mudstones, uh, the Mercia mudstone group, which has a lower section, which is called the Sidmouth mudstone, after Sidmouth down in, in Devon, and an upper section, the Branscombe mudstone. mudstone. And they're separated by the Arden sandstone. And the BGS, bless them, um, try and tell us that the Arden sandstone in the Wessex Basin is the same as the Arden sandstone in the Worcester Graben and in the West Midlands. Uh, it's not actually present in the Cheshire Basin, but it's also present in Nottinghamshire out into the East Midlands. And this is a, you know, it's 10 meters thick at most. Can it really be one continuous sandstone all of that way across that steep high, the Mendip High? Probably not. So I think actually that the sandstone that's present at that time interval in the Wessex Basin is not the same as the Arden sandstone. It's the same time, but it's not the same continuous sand body. So what we're going to talk about really is the Arden sandstone in the West Midlands. And that's this up to 10 meter thick sandstone. And you'll see as we go through the talk, it's actually very variable in character. At the same time as the Arden sandstone, in some of the basins, halite was deposited. So you had halite being precipitated at the same time. And if you get a chance after the talk, there's some samples of the Arden sandstone here with cubic pseudomorphs, halite crystals. So even the Arden sandstone had halite growing in it. So these were evaporitic lakes. The halite deposits get quite thick. And they're actually mined in Cheshire. So there were vast halite lakes precipitating halite at the same time as the Arden sandstone was deposited. And overall of that lot comes in the transgressions that mark the beginning of the Jurassic. So that set the strategic strategically for you. Um, let's now go on and look at some of those examples in, in the field. So Sidmouth East Cliff is the start of the Mercia Mudstone Group um, Sidmouth formation. And that's a fairly typical outcrop. Um, it contains um, thin siltstone beds. This is not the Arden Sandstone. The Arden Sandstone equivalent is higher up in the section, a little bit further to the east. Um, so red mudstones with thin green coloured siltstone beds. We're going to come back to the colour of those green beds in a, in a moment, try and explain them. Um, there's a very well-known core that was taken in Northern Ireland in Antrim, um, which has been published in a, in, a, in a wonderful paper that describes these textures, the only one I know of, in detail. And the halite has grown as crusts on these evaporitic ponds are then sunk to the bottom of the lake and creating layers of halite. So these were super saline lakes full of halite. Um, that'll do for that. <clears throat> Not too far from here, just south of Birmingham at Tudor Grange Park, you may, some of you may know of that, um, there was a geothermal borehole drilled. It's a bit of a funny story because um, Solihull Council paid for it. It was the best part of half a million pounds. Um, they drilled the borehole, they didn't line it, so it collapsed. And then when they got down to the, um, they were chasing the tarpaulin sandstones and Sherwood sandstone. It was so tight, it didn't flow. So it didn't work, but it's a great core. It's one of the few cores that go through 300 meters of Mercia mudstone group um, that's available to examine. I've logged it and we've done some various studies on it. Um, and lo and behold, it's, it, it contains gypsum nodules. So this stuff, at about the level of the Arden sandstone and, and, and below it, uh, these are nodules of calcium sulfate. They grew in the sediment. These are diagenetic. 
and I brought one example here of a similar piece of core. This is actually from the Middle East, but this contains gypsum growing in sediment as a diagenetic product. So not only was there halite forming, there was also gypsum growing in these, in these lakes. And lots of evidence when you look at the core, some nice sedimentology, laminated sediments, thin siltstone layers, clearly water lane. And irregular cyclicity, lots and lots of cycles of flooding, flooding events. So let's go and find a modern analog. Um, the first one I'm taking you to here is the Rands of Kutch in Western India. It's a lovely part of the world. It's actually a nature reserve. Uh, in, the, in the winter, in the monsoonal rains, it floods. Um, and then throughout the dry season, it evaporates and um, these big, these giant salt pans form. So if we convert this to Dudley, if I twist that round through 90 degrees, and this is the Worcester Graben or the West Midlands basins, Dudley's somewhere over here. And if you were on Patcham Island, there's Dudley, and you looked westwards, uh, sorry, eastwards, you'd see these large saline lakes with lots of mud cracks um, and lakes evaporating, precipitating sulfate. So in, in the Carnian, in the late Triassic, in these grabens in Western Britain, the desert sediments were full of lakes and they were evaporating. As you can see today in the, in, in the modern rounds of Kutch. Here's another quick analog. This was a holiday a couple of years ago. As COVID was coming to an end, we nipped off to the Cape Verde Isles where there are some freshwater lakes uh, being fed by rivers adjacent to the coast. Um, and they're incredibly evaporitic and the lakes are full of algae. So these are, uh, these are the coastal sand dunes. Um, these are the lakes and you can see these huge algal blooms, big algal mats, uh, algae blown by the wind against the edge of the lake. And you can see the lake sediments, they're, they're dark, they're, they go black because they're anoxic. And that comes from the organic matter. So these sediments in the lake, they don't go red, they stay black. Um, and the algal blooms, they, they bloom when the fresh water comes in and then when the lake goes saline, they die. And then the bacteria that live in the sediment chomp away at the algae and maintain the anoxic conditions. So you can stand, you can put one foot in black muds that would be green in the subsurface and put your right foot on red muds as they oxidize. So this interbedding of green and red muds is because the lakes were full of algal matter that were then eaten by bacteria as the <coughs> sediment was buried. And there was so much algal material, they, didn't, they never oxidized. So the mystery of these green colored beds in what is otherwise a red sequence is because the lakes were full of algae. And here's just one more example of a modern environment that I looked at some years ago. This is in uh, southeastern Australia, actually southwestern Australia, um, where various sedimentologists have looked at these lakes and the, the halite forms bedded halite where the lake waters last the longest. That's in the middle. And then in the mud flats on the side of the lakes, you get halite growing displacively along with gypsum. And off, wherever you get a groundwater table, you often get the gypsum uh, fabrics growing across the groundwater table. So these are modern analogues for what I think the Carnian looked like back in the Triassic. Saline lakes, evaporitic. And this is from um, a very sad story of a, uh, of a geologist who, who passed away um, some years ago um, in the field. It's a lesson, don't do field work on your own. Actually, make sure you've got somebody with you. Um, so Paul was doing field work on his own, had a heart attack and died in the field. There was nobody with him. He wasn't found for some time. And he was doing all this fantastic work on the Mercy and Mudstone group. Um, so he logged sections of Mercy and Mudstone group and pretty much got the story right. And his work was done in the Southern Worcester Graben. So he has cycles um, Above and, be, uh, above and below what is the equivalent of the Arden sandstone with, the, with gypsum forming 
uh, in the lakes, gypsum forming above from evaporation, and then a very wet phase in the middle, the Arden sandstone equivalent. Um, in the mudflats adjacent to the lakes, desiccation cracks, probably around rootlets. These are rhizoliths with um, plant vegetation growing on the surface. And then these structures are typical of soil structures, these sort of teepee desiccation structures, large um, saucer-shaped structures indicative of soil development, just what you'd expect on a dry evaporitic um, desert basin. So Leonard Wills actually first started recognizing this cyclicity back in the 1950s. If any of you have seen any of his papers, he was still publishing papers. It, his last paper, he was 93 that he got published. Extraordinary. So he first recognized the cycles back in the 1950s. His book, Paleogeography of the Midlands, is, is classic. Um, and then Arthurton, BGS, he actually then properly described the cyclicity for the first time in modern sedimentological terms, and Milroy made the first modern interpretation. All good stuff. So this is, this is not completely me thinking off the top of my head. There's a good um, scientific basis on which the Arden Sandstone story is based. Right, so I'm going to take you to a few outcrops of the Arden Sandstone to give you a flavour of its variability. So that's um, Inkbarrow, which is actually in Worcestershire. So if anyone drives along the A422, it's a spectacular cutting driving towards, uh, just through Inkbarrow. Um, what's Inkbarrow famous for? Somebody must know. The archers. the archers, exactly, home of the archers. So if you want to go in the pub and meet the archers, you can't. <clears throat> um, Henley and Arden uh, in Warwickshire, the Long Inchington uh, HS2 Northern Portal Tunnel, um, and a couple of exposures on the Grand Union Canal. So we're going to scoot through those and just see how variable the Arden sandstone really is. And that exposure on the right is the north bank of the Grand Union Canal at Rowington. And that's typical of the exposure. An another great effort from the Warwickshire Geological Conservation Group. A day clearing that, it was completely overgrown, now visible. What you'll see in most of my following slides before we get onto the arm waving stuff is that I make log profiles of outcrops and boreholes. And lo the log profiles are really, really useful because they tell us about the depositional system. Um, so I'm going to make descriptions of sand bodies, sedimentary structures, grain size, and that helps us recon reconstruct the depositional environment. That's basically how it works. So, Ingbarrow, home of the archers. Lovely roadside cutting. This package of the Arden sandstone is completely sand dominated. There's, there's almost no mudstone. Mudstone's less than 5%. The sands are all about the same sort of grain size look. So this is, this is the profile, five meters of it here. Um, there's a little bit more exposed recently. So this is now nearly seven meters thick in total. But this is grain size look, mud, silt, very fine, fine, medium, then coarse. So these are all coming out at medium, fine to medium, with a little bit of coarse, pebbly stuff at the bottom. So all a similar grain size, a few thin beds of mudstone. And if you look in detail, the mudstones have got little desiccation cracks that I've drawn there as these little V-shaped structures and some burrows. The sandstones, they're mostly horizontal bedded, planar bedded, with some troughs towards the tops. Um, some are cross bedded, but lots of plain beds, and some are rippled. And we'll see some nice examples of ripples. So this is a typical example of this, and I'm stressing the plain bedding because it's really quite important. So there's a bed top, and there's a bed bottom, and in between, they're all pretty much plain bedded. There's a bit of cross bedding in there. Look, you can just about make that out, but lots of these are plain bedded. And these are plain bedded in here too. So this is upper flow regime. Anyone got a mixer tap at home in their sink? Mixer tap or in their bath? Yeah. Mixer tap, yeah. So when you turn it on full and you look into the sink, does anyone notice the change in flow in the sink? No. When you, when you, so that's what you're going to do when you go home tonight. Turn the tap full on. When the water goes straight down into, into the sink, the initial flow is, is planar. 
and then you see a little standing wave, a little, almost like a little ripple, and then the flow becomes chaotic. So that standing wave is the transition between plane bed and turbulent flow. And that's what, we, that's what we see preserved in the rocks here. So the flow, when the plane beds are deposited, is really, really high. It's fast flow. We'll come back to that. And we'll see more logs for each of the outcrops we look at. So these are just more examples of the Ingbarrow outcrop. As you can see, lots of these nice plane beds. That was a very cold day, I remember. Um, here's some cross beds coming down onto a bedding surface there with some pebbles on that surface. This surface has ripples on it in here and ripples up there as well. So if you go back to my profile, that's the sort of sequence we're seeing there. Um, where's, where's, here's a good one. Yeah, so plain beds, some troughs, some cross beds with ripples on the top. So what I've shown here on the left is one example from that outcrop where you can see a sequence of plane beds, actually bedding plane surface to the next bedding plane surface. So that's the height of the bar. Um, that's all plane beds. In this one, we've got some dunes in here and then plane beds, some scours there, plane beds, more plane beds. So this is actually recording reducing water velocity. It's actually expressed as a thing called the Froud number, um, which relates to the water velocity and the water depth. <clears throat> so at a Froud number of one, that's that standing wave. Froud numbers of greater than one are very fast flowing. Above number one, they're slower flowing. So why is this important? Why is it important we have these plane beds? because they're high energy, they're flash floods. It's not, it's not just um, a riverbed flowing along depositing bars, it's upper flow regime plane beds. So they're flash floods. It's a huge amount of water traveling very, very quickly in a confined channel. So I think the ink barrow outcrop is an ingress point of sand being brought into Lake Arden, into this vast lake. And the water came under very, very high energy as a flash flood. Not just a slow flowing river, like the River Tame. It's a flash flood, a desert flash flood. High energy, upper flow regime. Here we go, it's Dudley on the map. I managed to squeeze you in just. So if you were standing somewhere here, on, on, on the hills around Dudley in the Trias, you'd be looking out across the Knoll Basin and this was an area of lakes. The pale yellow colour is the Arden sandstone outcrop. It, 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 it's present throughout that basin. It's present in the Worcester Graben, as far south as, almost as Bristol. Um, it extends into the Knoll Basin. It even extends around here. So we're going to see a section from Long Itchington in a minute. Um, it's certainly present in Coal Sill, and I suspect it goes as far as the Stafford Basin. So this is a lake into which sands were introduced at several points. And Ink Barrow was one of the input points where the river flowed into, into the lake. I also think it was the same at Rowington. Rowington was an input point where the river came into the lake. That's not the, tr that's not the case everywhere. Sometimes the section contains almost no sand. There was no sand being brought in, only being moved around in the So most of the rivers were coming from the south, flowing to the north or northeast, um, and there were several specific input points, one at Coles Hill, one at Inkbarrow, one at Rowington, not everywhere. When you move around the basin, the sedimentology of the Arden sandstone varies quite dramatically. Let's go to Henley and Arden. That's interesting. See what happens when. So the log hasn't displayed. Okay. Not to worry. We'll come back to that. The section at Henley and Arden does contain sand, but it also contains lots of mud. And despite the log not showing, the green bits are mostly mud. Um, 
the sands get quite coarse. Here's some conglomerates. Um, there's some small cross beds. Um, there's some muddy section here, muddy section below, and a few sands. So this is an, a section with interbedded sands and muds. I hope all the other sections haven't. Let's just move on a second. Whoa. No, we're okay. Right, so Henley and Arden. Let's just look at some of those in detail. Anyone see the ripples? Let's help you. There's the ripple top. And they're wave ripples. They have straight crests. There's some examples here I've brought. So these are wave ripples in the lake. This is a slice through one of the sandstones. Um, these are the thin um, interbedded sandstones. And these are burrows. They're biturbated. Some of the burrows are vertical. Some of these are more or less horizontal, uh, as are these. So the lake had animals living in it that were burrowing in the sediment. We probably know what some of those animals are. Uh, here's an example of uh, one of the ripple sandstones. Here's, here are the ripple crests. In fact, this one's here. And then there's burrowing activity in between the, tr in the troughs between the crests of the ripples. These funny, uh, these, these are um, a thing called planulites. I think this specimen's here as well. These are little horizontal, probably worm-like burrows living in the lake. Um, here's an example of some quite larger vertical burrows that extend for several centimeters. Um, there's a bigger one here, I think you can see them, yeah. Um, some plant fragments, and then this thing here, anyone know what Eustheria is? Eustheria? It's a conchostration, conchostration. It's a clam shrimp. So we're going to look at clam shrimp. So these, um, these are um, crustaceans that are able to survive desiccation. Um, this is a centimeter scale here. So these things are almost a centimeter in diameter, and there's lots of them. So some of these beds are covered in uh, Eustheria. So we've got um, grazing trails, which are snails, planulites, worm, bitebation, Eustheria, the clam shrimps, woody material, and crustacean burrows. Quite a lot of activity. Let's just look at clam shrimps very, very quickly. So clam shrimps have been around since the Permian. These are modern examples. Um, actually taken, I think, from uh, Australia. The world's largest clam shrimp, this one, is, is 10 mil, it's a centimeter in diameter. They're quite big. And here's some in a gentleman's hand um, for scale. And they're essentially crustaceans that live inside a shell. And when sediment desiccates, they're able to be dormant and survive for years without any water. So these are super indicative of desiccation and then being able to blossom and, and, and multiply when it gets wet. So they're actually found mostly in temporary freshwater bodies and in ephemeral ponds and lakes, and they survive desiccation. And when rains come or it's a flood again, they, they thrive, they, they, they multiply. And we've got the Arden sandstones full of them. So the Arden sandstone was ephemeral, it dried out, was re-wetted when the seasonal rains came and the flash floods came, and the clam shrimps, they diversified and they multiplied. So I'm starting to paint a picture of what this lake was like for you. Um, this is now a borehole, an outcrop. This is um, the northern portal of um, Long Inchington HS2 tunnel. Um, there's Dorothy going in to bore the tunnel, and these are the sides of the, of the cutting in front of the tunnel which exposed the Arden sandstone rather beautifully. Thank you very much, HS2. And I've looked at some of their boreholes, I've logged several of them, and this outcrop. Uh, it's full of desiccation cracks. It's a very, very muddy sequence. And in the middle of it, the Arden sandstone, it contains thin sandstones. Above it, it has sulfate beds, beds of gypsum. And below it, this is because the boreholes were drilled below this sulfate dissolution front. These are from what are they, nearly 30 meters depth. So at this depth, the sulfate hasn't been dissolved. It's an important point about most of the trias, most of the Mercy Mudstone group. It was full of sulfates, but at outcrop, you don't see them because they're dissolved away. Both halite and gypsum. Only in boreholes do you see them. And when these beautiful cores, um, you can see all the structures preserved rather nicely. Um, this is a package of only about two meters of sand. 
So this is the lake margin sequence. No big rivers bringing in sediment as flash floods. This is the lake margin. The lake margin was uh, desiccating because it's full of uh, desiccation cracks, drying out mud cracks, uh, with, with anhydrite and gypsum nodules. So this is the lake margin. Remember the pictures from Cape Verde? You could put one foot in the algal rich lake, stayed green, and you could have one foot on the red mudstones, oxidizing. It's exactly what's going on here. So if you want a good holiday to study modern analogues for the Trias, I recommend highly Cape Verde. It's also quite a nice place to go. Right, so th this is the triple uh, SSI in Warwickshire for the Arden Sandstone, it's the type locality. It was first described by this, this wonderful gentleman, the Reverend Peter Bollinger Brodie. Uh, and there's his log from 18, 1858, I think it is. Uh, not bad. It's it, remarkably accurate. What a good man. OK, there's no sedimentology, but he's pretty much got all the layers right. Um, and he's labelled where he found his um, labyrinthodon remains. Um, here's his Eustheria beds, more Eustheria. Um, this is a fish, uh, Semeniontus. Um, and then he's got rhynchosaurs and ripple marks. So he pretty much got it right. What a hero. 1850s. And we cleared this section. Um, bizarrely, so, uh, so there's my log, um, there's the red mudstones at the base, and that we've, not, we've now logged the whole thing since I put this talk together, but um, it's, this is a sandy sequence that starts off into bedded sands and shales and then goes sandy towards the top. I don't think this is an input river point. I think this is the lake margin with more sand in it that's just being washed by, by the, on, on the shoreline. So this, this is um, underwater as the lake is desiccating. Um, this is then in sand bodies within the lake being moved around by, by wind or, uh, or currents in the lake. And then back into a red mudstone sequence on top. Lots of nice sedimentary structures, which I think include yeah, you've got more nice ripples in there, uh, more plain beds. So a little bit of high energy stuff. Um, some nice halides too, the moths. So here we go, look. And this specimen is here on, on, on the table. Uh, more ripples and burrows. So that was um, the outcrop before the Canal and Rivers Trust and the Warwickshire Geological Conservu Conservation Group decided to clear and reveal the exposure. Wonderful, wonderful walks in the summer. Lovely. Um, this is what we did to it with help from the Green Recovery Fund. Had ironic, of course, it's overgrown again. So, yeah, the whole sequence now beautifully exposed um, and, and, and logged. And we put together um, with the Canal and River Trust um, a, an explanatory panel with bits about the sedimentology and R the Reverend Brody. Um, I think you've done a similar thing here, haven't you, on the Dudley Canal? You had funding with the Canal and River Trust to restore a section here, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So great folks in the Canal River Trust have been very, very helpful and supportive. Um, so one more outcrop here um, on the Grand Union Canal. It was horribly overgrown. We've cleared it off. And there's now this rather nice section. This is the type section in the BGS memoir. Um, this is another river input. So red sediments at the base, the green interbedded material. This is probably shore face, and then this top stuff, I think, is another river input. Because um, this package from here, that's one sand body, and there's a second one there with, the, with some slumping in it. And this is almost a metre thick. That's one bed, that's a river depth, one metre. So these were, they weren't huge, they weren't Brahma Puta type river channels, but they were at least, the water depth was at least a metre deep. And we looked at the width of them in both Ink Barrow and here, um, and they're at least 200 metres wide, potentially 300 metres wide. So they're not huge channels. Um, and within these channels, there were flash floods, stacked flash floods, repeated to flowing. So just to briefly tell you about this um, wonderful reverend, Peter Bellinger Brody. Um, he was the um, vicar... Um, at, uh, in fact, the rector at um, Rowington Church, 
uh, in, in North Warwickshire. Uh, it's a lovely church. It's made of the Arden sandstone. Um, there was a display, not anymore, in Warwick Museum with his bust and some of the history of Brodie, uh, which was a great uh, display, really useful. Uh, his grave is there. His grave's actually just on the front of the church, uh, now in a laurel hedge. It's a bit sad, isn't it? You've got no control of what happens to your gravestone when you're gone. Um, I tried to get this removed, but uh, they can't do it. The owner on the other side is not keen on having his laurel hedge cropped, so I'm afraid Brodie's grave is still partly hidden. Uh, but in the church, uh, there's a window dedicated to Brodie. Um, of course, you're not allowed, it, it's, it's sacrilegious to have um, a named face um, in a church. So um, he's depicted as St. Peter, but that's clearly Brody. <laughs> um, and here we go, there's, here's, here's the recital in the panel just here, giving thanks to God for the honoured memory of Sir Peter Bellinger Brody, M-A-F-G-S, 45 years vicar of the parish, um, 1899. Yeah. So if you're in if you're in North Warwickshire, if you're in if you're in Rowington, go and look at the Arden Sandstone. But pop into the church as well. It's it's a it's a wonderful church. Many of the churches in North Warwickshire and stately homes are made of the Arden Sandstone. It's a it's a great building stone. Quartz root sandstone cemented by dolomite. Okay. So Brodie's collection, it was huge. Um, he had these um, um, cerithium, uh, so-called hand beasts. It forms this sort of um, four-pronged um, footprint. Um, this is a rinkosaur. You can just, just about make out the, the footprints here. Um, there you go, these, these things here, yeah. Um, so the rinkosaurs were small um, reptiles. I was surprised how small they were, actually. I mean, they're, 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 they're like, um, normal common lizards, they're, really, they're, they're actually very small, um, but these are very common. Um, these are the fish that Brody found and described and published, um, as well as finding 25,000 fossils. He, he published some 30 or 40 papers of that order. Um, and the fish uh, from Shrewley, I, believe me, I have looked, I can't find any fish, I've looked, I've looked for footprints too. The, the days of finding exotic fossils, I think, are rare. And the Brodie collection had um, some 20 or so of, of these things, these pointy things. So they're the dorsal spines from shark fins. And we met a, um, a specialist in fossil sharks, and he reckons fins, spines of this size, meant the shark body length was between one and a half and two meters. So these were quite big sharks. I mean, that's an interesting point. How do you get sharks in landlocked lakes? That's not straightforward, is it? Or is it? Maybe there was a marine connection. So, a really diverse fossil fauna in the Arden sandstone, in these lakes. Quite spectacular. So, just to show you how varied the Arden sandstone is. So, I've logged I don't know, almost some 30 sections now. Here's a selection of them from various places, BGS boreholes, HS2 boreholes, outcrops. Um, it's described as a monotonous, silty sandstone. It isn't. Actually, the grain size varies hugely. I mean, sometimes it is silty, but sometimes it's actually really quite coarse grained. Uh, can you correlate any sections? No. You certainly cannot correlate beds. So it's, it's highly variable. Some, sometimes you see these fluvial input sections as in Rowington, as at Ink Barrow, but these are lake margins. This is a lake margin. That's the one we couldn't see on the Henley and Arden slide. Um, this, these are lake margins. So a few sand input points to the lake, but most of the outcrop of the Arden sandstone is lake margin, shore face, and subaqueous sand deposits really quite variable and only green where the algal blooms were in the lake. Everywhere else you're back into red mudstones just like in the Cape Verde Isles. So I hope I've convinced you that the Arden sandstone in Lake Arden is highly variable, it's brought in by rivers and this large lake, and let's, let's just see if we can work out the extent of the lake. 
Um, so by putting, pulling together all the outcrops, um, you can find outcrops um, down here, oops, well, um, down here in the southern part of the Worcester Graben, um, south of Malvern, uh, all the way up to Coles Hill. I now think they go north into um, the northern part of the Worcester Graben towards the Stafford Basin. So this is taken from the map that Leonard Wills put together um, from these various publications, but this is his key one, the Trisic Session in the Central Midlands. This is where he published his view of the map. I've modified it because I think we've, we've, we've got a better picture of how it extended now. Um, it also shows the, um, the halite and the gypsum deposits. So the halite is well known around Drawtwich, as well as in Stafford and Cheshire, and the less well-known deposit in the Needwood Basin. And then you've got these big gypsum deposits also in the North Sea, um, East Midland Shelf, and in the Needwood Basin. So the gypsum and halite were deposited in the lake centers, and the sand came in around the margins of the lake. And I'd now make my Lake Arden sandstone uh, extend up here as well. Some of the stuff I've seen in HS2 boreholes uh, go across the um, South Staffs coalfield into the Stafford Basin. They've also got the Arden sandstone in it. So I'd extend it further up this western side. So you could, as we said earlier, you could, you could be sitting here in, in the Dudley Hills in the Trias looking out over Lake Arden. It's, really, it's truly local. This is some 100 kilometers. So it's a big lake. A bit like the Rons of Kutch. River input from the lake margins, probably one here, um, one around Inkborough, probably from this highland here, uh, and another one around um, just north of Warwick where the Rowington section is. So lake margins bringing sediment in rivers as flash floods, not continuous, but ephemeral flash floods, making the lake which then became evaporitic. So Will's really one of my heroes. I mean, uh, we geologists now use paleogeography as a tool to reconstruct environments back through time. But it was Will's that really had the first idea. Um, he even made um, a map of the Paleozoic floor of southern Britain back in the 1970s, which is, which is extraordinary. It's, it's, it's looking underneath the Mesozoic cover, even more adventurous than just a paleogeographic map. So yeah. Quite a special man. Um, yeah. So I've actually taken this from um, uh, another former colleague um, who published this uh, in, in, in 2014. He was looking in the Central North Sea and was describing how rivers came to an end, and they're called um, terminal splays. It's the end, and, and there are good examples of modern terminal splays uh, in several desert basins, particularly in, in, in Australia. Um, so when rivers come to an end, they just run out of water, um, and they're called terminal splays. Um, so the terminal splays, um, they then end in a lake, which when it evaporates has, has, has this halite crust. Um, on the flanks of the rivers, you'll see aeolian dunes, um, in the river channel itself, there are bars and upper flow regime plain beds, uh, uh, as we've seen. Um, and old river courses, when they dry out, they preserve the in-channel bars as uh, ex exposed dunes. So this is probably a, a pretty good analog for the Arden sandstone. We had rivers that were ephemeral and flash rivers, desert floods that came into the uh, basins of the West Midlands ended in terminal splays adjacent to the players, which were evaporating. And we call this the Carnian pluvial event, because for most of the Trias, it was dry. There were no rains. And for this one period in the Carnian, when the Arden sandstone was deposited, it appears to have rained a huge amount for about one to two million years. So what we saw at um, Rowington and Inkbarrow are the river input points, um, and around the lake margin you see shore face sequences. 
So why did climate suddenly go from being hot and dry to being very wet? There have been several theories, not entirely happy with any of them actually, um, but what you can see around the world, now people have started looking at the Carnian and some quite famous scientists have been doing this for the last I don't know, six, seven, eight years, um, there are distinct patterns. So on, the, on this scale here, this is geological time again, this is the Carnian, it's from about 234 to 230-ish million years, so about 4 million years in total. Um, and on this um, scale here, there are various activities and, and events. Um, the Carnian is actually split into um, subunits. They're called the Julian and the Tuvalian. Um, that's a level of detail we don't really need, but the Arden sandstone is, is late Julian, essentially. And what you see in lots of proxies, so this is thorium uranium, or this is... Um, it's, uh, this is global humidity, um, this is um, sea level change, thorium, uranium, um, potassium, aluminium, um, this is lead, uh, mercury in TOC weight percent, um, and these are uh, uh, carbon isotopes uh, and PDB. So what you see around the world in many, many localities are cycles. And there's typically one, two, three, four. You can see that. Um, I looked at some sections with one of the proponents of the Carnian pluvial event, um, Alistair Ruffle, last summer down in Devon. You can pick up four distinct cycles in the sedimentology really, really nicely. Um, you see it in TOC levels. You see it in these uh, elemental ratios. Um, you see it in uh, carbon isotopes. So there is cyclicity is global, and it's seen in lots of proxies and in many, many places around the world. So this is not a local thing specific to the West Midlands. The Carnian changing climate was happening around the world. It's global. Um, and lots of scientists, I'm not entirely with them, they picked out this thing called the Rangelia uh, flood basalt event. These are the Rangelia flood basalts. Anyone familiar with the Deccan basalts in India? I mean, they're blamed for the uh, end of the dinosaurs, creating ash clouds and turning the earth cold. Um, the Rangelia is a similar event. It's as, it's as big as the Deccan, but it's west of America. So you've got some three kilometers of basalts that poured out in the Carnian. And so scientists have jumped on this in the way that scientists jumped on the Deccan in India as being of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary as being the end of the dinosaurs. They've jumped on this as being the cause of the dinosaurs' evolution. Wow. And even the Daily Mail got the story. So if the Daily Mail says volcanicity triggered the dawn of the dinosaurs, it's got to be true, hasn't it? Because we all believe the Daily Mail. So there you go. They didn't quite get the date right. Well, they did say around 200 million years ago, but there you go. Yeah, the, the, the Daily Mail had the, um, the Carnian Plebley event being caused by um, the Rangelia basalts that caused um, the dawn of the dinosaurs. Wow. Not that I read the Daily Mail. Um, so let's just take this global view. Let's just see what was happening in the Carnian uh, 230 million years ago. So the W... That's this thing here. This is, this, so this is Pangaea. The coloured land is, is Pangaea. The pale blue are the coastal areas around the flanks of Pangaea. That's where we are. There's Britain stuck there. Um, and then the blue are, are the big oceans. Um, the red lines are subduction zones, pretty much as they are in South America today, modified version of North America. And there's huge subduction zone around um, what is now the China Sea. Uh, on the edge of Paleotethys. Uh, there's a spreading centre, another spreading centre here. So North Pangaea and, South, and Gondwana are being pushed apart. Um, and this W here, these are these flood basalts west of America with three kilometres of outpouring of basalts, supposedly the cause of climate change. Um, some other scientists uh, believe that actually, um, because the... Um, 
the climatic belts. This was a, a huge area of um, cyclones, lows, this was highs. So there's one view that has actually these belts migrated and it was movement of the lows across um, north eastern Pangaea that were responsible for the climate change. Another bunch of scientists completely poo-pooed that. So the answer is we don't really know. Whether it was volcanism or changes in climatic belts, we don't know. <clears throat> uh, there are also um, a suite of volcanic events uh, at the same time um, on the northern side of Neotepis. Nothing like the same volume as Rangelia, but much, much closer to home. So, we really don't know. It's still wild speculation. What caused this sudden climate change? Why did it rain for two million years, pretty much non-stop? And this is the effect it had on large tetrapods. In the early Triassic, virtually all of the tetrapods were crocodiles. Some of them got quite large. So they're what we call crurotarsans. And they became, they became quite diverse. They didn't die out, but all of a sudden, at the Carnian, at, 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 this, at this period of time, for these two million years, when it suddenly started raining, there's this huge increase in diversity of dinosaurs. Small ones at first, but then got much bigger. And it happened incredibly quickly. Mike, Professor Mike Benton at Bristol has spent a lot of time looking at these. He's, he says the change in tetrapod diversity is just phenomenal. In a period of three to five million years, the change is extraordinary. It's a huge evolutionary change. And, and really, yeah, the, the Carnian has not been recognized before this work as a period of huge evolutionary change. So, you know, the Arden Sandstone, you can go and visit it. It's, you know, it, it's, it's literally 30 minutes drive away from here. You can go and walk on the Arden Sandstone. You have, you've walked the canal. It's a lovely walk, it's an easy walk. You can go and stand the dawn of the dinosaurs on the Arden Sandstone. It's so close to you. You can go on the hill, you can stare across to Birmingham and visualize the lake that was Arden, Lake Arden in the late Triassic. This is all local stuff. So um, I'm gonna stop there, um, just leave you with these thoughts. Um, on a nice sunny day, um, summer in 2024, you can wander down the Grand Union Canal, walk past the Triple SI and see our, uh, our, our interpretation panel, trace and imagine the downpour of rains in the Carnian and the flash floods, um, blooms of clam shrimps in the resulting lake, uh, dinosaurs walking around the margins of the lake leaving their footprints, the dawn of the dinosaurs in truly Warwickshire. So I hope you've enjoyed a bit of local geology, a bit of global geology, a bit of speculation, a bit of science, some photographs, canal side walks, occasional hero, Brody and Wills, volcanoes, and speculation on climate change. There we go. Thank you. OK, well, thank you, everyone, for staying awake. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Professor Burley, uh, it forced me on behalf of the society uh, to say what a wonderful grand tour of a particular unit that we knew. <laughs> Most of us knew not very little about this particular geological unit until you all were encompassing all features included to it. So, would you like to join me in thanking Prof Burley in the usual way?